working with the board of directors and helping them build their capacity for governance and leadership. I do a great deal of strategic planning, um, organizational assessments, and then I also do leadership transitions where I can be hired to be the interim executive director to help guide um, an organization through a leadership transition. And my, my most recent um, foray into that was with the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, um, and which turned into a great transition, I'm very happy to announce. So um, what we're going to talk about today is um, really the specifics of how to work through a leadership transition. We're going to talk about um, the differences between change and transition. We're going to talk about the steps that are needed prior to beginning a search that um, includes doing an internal assessment, an executive profile, and making a decision about whether to use outside assistance. We'll talk about the responsibilities of a transition committee or a search committee, um, also how to screen and interview potential candidates. We'll discuss the critical communication points throughout the process, and then what to do once you have a new director hired. Lindsay, next. So what you should see in front of you on the slide is two circles with the executive search um, on the top. This is a, an illustration provided by Board Source from the book CEO Succession Planning by Nancy Axelrod. Great book, by the way. Um, the first smaller circle is about um, ongoing succession planning, which we um, already covered in a previous webinar called The Art of Succession Planning. And then the darker circle that I'm sure is very difficult to read, but <laughs> is the, really the step-by-step -step of how to conduct a search for a new chief executive. And we are going to talk about each of these steps um, as we go through the webinar today. Next. So let's talk about change versus transition. Change really <clears throat> creates a great deal of pressure on any organization, and there are many different responses to change depending on who you are in the organization. Change is actually the act of making a situation different. It is very situational and external. It usually starts when you've got an announcement that the chief executive is leaving or has left and has a very specific target date. But in order for that change to actually occur, you have to have transition. Transition is the journey that from one identity to another. It is internal. It does not work on dates or time frames, and oftentimes will make you somewhat crazy because there are no time frames for the transition. It's, be it's because it's something that has to occur internally in the hearts and the minds of all of those who are actually affected by the change. Next, the um, <clears throat> phases of transition, the Kellogg Foundation actually has studied the various phases of executive transitions and, and identified very specific strategies and activities that can help nonprofits plan for and then navigate through a successful executive transition. So those three phases are the endings, the neutral zones, and beginnings. Managing the change requires a thorough understanding of all three of the phases. They overlap, but are very distinct phases of transition. Um, employees of the organization, board members of the organization, even the organization as a whole, has to experience each of these phases in order to have a successful change occur. So what I suggest is that it, it can be very valuable to design your plan taking into account the three phases of the transition. Um, and so what I'm going to suggest is that the board uh, consider creating a transition committee to address each of the areas. And if you don't have a transition committee, it, it could be the executive committee that takes on the functions of the transition committee. Next. So let's talk about first phase, and that's the ending phase. And before you can begin something new, if you think about this, before you can start something new, you really have to end what used to be. So beginnings depend on endings. Unfortunately, people don't like endings. Um, remember that <clears throat> the starting point for your transition is not going to be the outcome. It's going to be the ending that you'll have to make to leave your old situation behind, letting go of the old reality and the old identity. So transitions begin with letting go of something. 
And think of a big change in your life, maybe your first management job, the birth of your first child, moving to a new house. Each one of those big changes had to start with an ending. So, for example, you know, when you had the birth of your first child, you had to let go of regular sleep, you had to learn to let go of extra money, you let go of time alone spent with your spouse. All of those things had to end when you had this big change in your life. So even with good changes, there are transitions that, let go, that begin with letting go of something. And these are the endings. And you know, there are losses, very deep sometimes losses. And the failure to identify and be ready for the losses experienced during the endings can be the largest single problem to, your, to an organization going through transition. It's not the change that people necessarily are resisting. It's the loss and the endings that they are experiencing that, they will, that causes the resistance. So what happens during the endings? You, everybody needs to have the opportunity to say goodbye and express appreciation, no matter what. Employees are going to mourn their former leader and how things used to be, even if it wasn't great. It's still what they know, and they need to be able to mourn how things used to be. You'll find people are waiting for the next ax to fall. You'll probably see the gossip mill beginning to run rampant. Employee self-esteem may suffer, and many are going to need to work through feelings of loss or anger. So some strategies I might recommend for you to think about in coping with endings is, first of all, identify who is actually losing what and expect and accept the signs of grieving and acknowledge their losses openly. And really treat the past with respect. I sometimes see board members, you know, maybe in their enthusiasm for a future that's going to be so much better than the past, may talk slightingly about the old ways. But when they do that, they're really consolidating the resistance against the transition because people identify with the th way things used to be, and thus they feel that their self-worth is at stake when the past is being attacked. The trick is to, to talk about it very non-judgmentally. You can honor the past for what it has accomplished and still be excited about moving forward to the future. You also have to give people time or for the change to sink in. It, it's going to require a major shift, perhaps, in the way that the work gets done. So you're going to see organizational culture typically changing. Um, and there's a process th that's important for the change to occur successfully. So let that process happen naturally. And don't rush individuals. They need to grieve at their own pace, just as we would um, had somebody died. Um, we understand in, with death that everybody grieves at a different pace and a different rate and go, moving through the stages. It's going to be very true for this as well. They, they need to be able to grieve at their own pace. Um, be sure to allow sufficient opportunity to say goodbye and to acknowledge the ending. I find sometimes you know, having some kind of ceremony of sorts gives people an opportunity for that for, fair, formal farewell. During the ending phase, board and staff will begin to reflect on how things were in the past. So to start your transition planning, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get in to the thing. Um, so start your transition planning that can include perhaps a quick review of the circumstances around which the ED is departing, um, the important presenting issues facing the organization and what if any interim management is going to be needed. You can help the outgoing executive director determine key goals for the organization in his or her remaining tenure. You can explore challenges that could confront a new ED. You're going to want to think carefully about how to handle public relations, and we'll talk about that several times about communication. But the communication about the departure, how is information about the departure going to be conveyed to staff, to your clients, to, to your members, to the funders, to your general community. Um, and these initial planning steps can really help make the next phase of the transition much more successful. Um, okay, next, Lindsay. <clears throat> I'm trying to join while I'm talking at the same time, so be patient with me as I um, might stumble a little bit. Mm -hmm. Very strange. 
Colleen, just as a point of reference, we're on uh, phase two neutral zone slide. Yep, perfect, great. So the neutral zone, <clears throat> and uh, anyway, the neutral zone. This is um, the phase when neither the old ways nor the new ways are getting any work satisfactorily. It's kind of like being in the twilight zone without Rod Sterling there to help guide you. You're going to be see lacking clear systems and signals. It, it actually can be a very chaotic time. But the neutral zone can also provide incredible creativity opportunities. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that you find ways to capitalize on the confusion by fostering innovation during this phase. This is not just a meaningless waiting and confusion time. It's a time that's necessary to reorient and redefine um, the organization, and people need to understand that. It's kind of, think about it as kind of like the winter time when while well, the spring's new growth is still taking shape you know, under the earth that hasn't burst forth yet. It, it's that kind of time. So what you're going to see are systems and cultures can become a bit crazy. Your employees might feel Im immobilized and be less productive. You might see increased absenteeism. Clearly anxiety is going to start to rise and motivation will start to fall. You might even see some um, old weaknesses or old problems reemerge because it's that kind of crazy chaotic time. Old resentments might resurface. Um, information gets miscommunicated. Teamwork among employees can break down if you're not paying attention to that, and, and loyalty to the organization might suffer. So let's <clears throat> some things that you can do during the neutral zone in general is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, during the neutral is, is first of all, pay attention to direct communication. During this uh, phase, clear systems and signals are often lacking. So e communication really can help keep people feeling included and connected to the organization. Without a communication channel that's appropriate, you're going to see rumors multiply. People are going to alternate between anxiety and apathy. Um, and it's very critical that mid-management and board be as direct and honest as possible. Tell the truth. Don't gloss over anything or minimize anything. Share as much information as possible as you can. You know, and if you want to be cautious, people are going to think you're hiding something. So it's okay to say something like, well, as far as I know, we'll have somebody, we'll have start the search in three weeks. Or as far as I can tell you, the board has developed a communication plan. Whatever it is, it's, you know, it's okay to say you're not sure. Um, and you might want to think about new ways of communicating within the organization because, as I said, old systems sometimes don't work. So look for new ways to, be, to communicate. You want to look for threads of continuity. Having something, whether it's some of the work conditions or some of the policies, some of the procedures you follow, and something that's not going to change will give employees and will give board members some sense of stability that will help address the things that are changing. And it doesn't have to be really big. It could be something as simple as we're going to keep our weekly staff meetings. Um, the board meeting is going to continue to be the third Thursday of every month. You know, it's something very specific that people can hang on to that really, really will help um, deal with the other things that are changing. So think about what might stay the same. Um, you know, is it the staff are staying? We, our board president is still staying? And build on the stability to move forward for new opportunities. And, and work to build a sense of team if you can, because as I said, oftentimes you'll see teamwork start to break down in the neutral zone. So it, it's really important to work hard at keeping that team um, built. You also want to encourage creativity and innovation. Um, the key to succeeding during this phase is giving folks a chance to do something new and interesting, to pursue a goal with energy and courage. It, this might be a great time to look for new ways of doing things. It might be, it absolutely is a great time to kind of step back and take stock of the organization to question the usual and maybe come up with some new and creative solutions to organizational difficulties. Constantly model that behavior. Um, providing opportunities for creativity, whether it's a staff retreat or a policy review, a suggestion campaign, whatever, really helps encourage that innovation. Um, you could provide training on innovation and creativity. Encourage other people to experiment. 
everyone always has some idea that they were wishing they could try. So embracing, embrace losses as an entry point for new solutions. And absolutely restrain your natural impulse in times of disorganization to push prematurely for cl closure. And finally, you, you might, as you're doing this creativity and innovation, look at redesigning the work. If we ask people to do their old job and then add on new pieces, you know what you're going to hit, that major brick wall, that's, that resistance to, to the change. So look, think about ways to redesign how and what is done as part of the organization. It might be necessary to create some temporary systems because you might see hierarchy breaking down during the neutral zone phase and you maybe mix up some groupings like project teams. You might give people temporary titles like acting manager. Um, definitely a great time to review policies and procedures. Are they best suited to the old way of doing things? Um, set some realistic short-term goals. You know, you don't want to set people up for failure by promising them high levels of productivity. Productivity. If something can wait, let it. You really have to prioritize. One of the things we learned um, when I was at Skavasa um, is that it, it was so overwhelming, we, and the staff were adding on lots of jobs, and it, it was just causing so much chaos and stress. And so we had to sit down and think about what needed to get done in the short term and made a very difficult decision that we were going to have to step back from being at the State House for a legislative session. And that was really, really hard for us because that's critical to what our coalition d does. Um, but the fact of the matter was we did not have the manpower and staffing. We did pull in some volunteers and we did have a couple board members who kept things moving along so that, you know, we weren't completely gone, but we just couldn't be, you know, the strong voice at the state house. And and it, other coalitions are going to need to do that also is think about can we get everything done and if we can't, what's most important to focus on in the short term. So you want to focus in on priorities and short term goals. Um, next, Lindsay, we should be on the transition committee. So when the executive director is getting ready to depart, it demands extensive leadership and activity by the board. This is one of the scariest times in the life of a board is when the executive director is leaving and they have to find somebody new. doesn't matter what the circumstances were under which the executive director departed. A healthy transition is going to require many tasks of the board. So to coordinate all of those facets, boards find it very helpful to create an ad hoc executive transition committee. It usually includes one, two or three key board office members. Um, the chair typically will serve on the transition committee as well. And sometimes I found it helpful to have one or two staff members on the communication committee as well so that they can serve as a uh, I said on the communication committee, I mean on the transition committee, to act as kind of that communication channel between the committee and the whole staff. Um, having a committee that can demonstrate very swift and energized activities is going to reassure your stakeholders and will give confidence to all of your constituents. Um, the committee is going to address public awareness about the transition. They're going to identify the short-term goals that, they, that need to be achieved during the transition. They can serve as the search committee, although I, I would say that if they are going to ser serve as the search committee, the staff members do not have a vote on who the successor would be, obviously. And then they're the ones that will help create the bridge for the new executive director. So all of these tasks you see on the slide um, are very specific tasks that the transition committee will um, take care of. You know, the, the send-off for the departing executive director, um, deciding on interim management if it's needed, um, setting the short-term goals, and thinking, of, you know, thinking about what the new executive director is going to need when they come in. All of those things are very important. So um, next is developing the communication plan. Considerable uncertainty and anxiety really do mark leadership transition periods. People are scared. And you don't want staff members and other stakeholders having to interpret puffs of smoke coming from the board to figure out what's going on. The, the, so you need to be sure that the search committee chair keeps the entire board apprised of exactly where the committee is. Um, the board needs to decide who's going to be the official spokesperson on the status of the search. Um, you want to keep the entire community up to date on the status of the transition. 
So some time where that might happen is um, announcing why your chief executive is departing, providing information about their term of service, highlight his or her accomplishments. You can uh, take time to announce the formation of your search committee and its projected time frame. Once you have a chief executive recruitment profile developed, you're, it's a great time to encourage applicants by circulating that widely. Um, you want to provide follow-up communication to keep people informed um, of the status of the search. Of course, you're going to formally announce the appointment of a new chief executive and relevant information about them. And I guarantee, absolutely promise you, that the search will take longer than you expect. Um, people are going to likely feel both excitement and fear about the possibilities. So making sure that you provide regular, timely, and meaningful updates um, is really, really important. And it's one of the things that causes the most challenges every time I have worked with an organization doing a transition is that they don't communicate with the staff regularly. We might have the board chair come in and talk to the staff initially about why the change is happening or what's going to be happening. But then there's no uh, ongoing contact with the staff after that. So three or four weeks later, they're like, well, what's going on? You know, what's been happening? Do we have anybody? Is that they started looking? You know, they really need to know what's going on, as does the board um, regularly. Next, you want to stabilize daily operations. So um, as the board's devoting time and energy to the search for a new executive, it also has to make sure that the day-to-day -day needs of the organization are being met. So while the transition committee is working to put its plan into place, another committee, um, maybe the executive committee, should be working on a plan for interim management of the organization. And that plan needs to address who's going to be in charge during the transition. Is it going to be the departing executive? Is it going to be the board chair? Is it going to be an interim director that's hired specifically for that? Somebody has to be accountable for day-to-day -day operations. Because as I said, I promise you it's going to take longer than you think it's going to. So somebody's got to be in charge. Um, you have to make that call about whether your organization can continue to provide a full range of services. Um, you've got to have somebody to make sure that the books and records, the information systems, the physical property of the organization are all secure and properly maintained during the transition. Um, you need somebody to oversee the policies and procedures if necessary, and maybe um, a review of the organizational systems and policies and procedures if necessary. It, um, it could include reviewing the accuracy of the budget and the financial information, the personnel policies and records, your contracts, um, all of that kind of thing. So somebody needs to stabilize the daily operations. So I'm going to suggest next that um, the board will, should consider whether or not it needs to bring in um, professionals to help with the transition. Um, they need to consider, you know, do they want to hire an interim chief executive? It's, um, it's a, a ch an interim chief executive is a great way to bridge the leadership gap between the departure of the incumbent and the start of the successor. And having an interim um, person in there gives the board time to determine what the organization needs in its next executive. It gives them time to conduct a thorough search um, to help the organization address key issues that might need attention before qualified candidates can be um, brought in. It, it, it provides continuity in leadership during which can be a very um, extended period of great uncertainty. I, I do want to say that um, interim interim executive directors are typically are not um, somebody not just another board member if, if you're or a staff member if you're going to consider hiring an interim interim folks all over the country they are specialized in really helping take advantage of this neutral zone um, creativity they really provide a phenomenal um, uh, outside eye to your policies and your procedures, your organizational systems, and can make some recommendations to really kind of um, uh, stabilize the foundation of the organization. Um, and I often find when you ask somebody to, a staff member to serve as the interim, they also have to do their other job, and that that's that's craziness. It's just too much work for one person to do. So. 
if you decide to use a staff person, I would suggest that you then kind of think through rejuggling everybody's job responsibilities during the temporary time um, so that the staff person um, can can you know realistically do the job and but you do need to have somebody who can whether it's somebody on your transition team, a staff member, or a professional coming in to help you, um, at, you know, for the board to think about. And you can also, uh, the board can consider retaining a, a search consultant. Um, and, and that decision would be based on a number of variables, not the least of which is the, the ability to pay the fee for, um, you know, a headhunter firm or a, other consultant. Um, also, thinking about, um, the time indiv individual members of the search committee and board members are willing to invest in the search process, you know, the skill and expertise level of your board members um, br that they bring to the table, and you know, do you have somebody with really strong HR background that can help lead the effort, um, and, you know, do you have a pool of qualified and interested candidates already, in, in which case you might not need a search um, firm. I, and a lot of times one of the things I'll do is when I come in as an interim, I will also help with the search. So that is something to consider um, if for any of you who are getting ready to ent enter this transition period, that maybe you can find somebody who can do both. Um, so I think the greatest value of a search professional is that they can really dedicate more concentrated time and expertise on the steps needed for this transition more so than a typical volunteer who serves on your nonprofit board. Next. Colleen, if I can, uh, yeah, before we go on to that, this is Lindsay from NNEDB. I just want to also plug that um, a lot of coalitions um, and local programs in this, in terms of retaining other professionals, um, can look to their state coalitions for local programs and state coalitions can look to TA providers like the National Network to End Domestic Violence or the Resource Sharing Project. Um, and also statewide uh, nonprofit associations can sometimes provide can sometimes provide these services um, or at least some coaching around this um, kind of transition in this particular um, hiring um, of an interim executive director or executive search consultant. Um, they can play in that role either for free or as part of uh, your membership dues to either the state coalition or to the national national program. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, yeah, that's on to the next. Yeah, yeah thank you, Deborah, because um, definitely there are lots of resources available to you um, to find somebody. So thanks for that. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so next slide is talking about institutional assessment. And if you will recall, um, at the very beginning I t of the talking about this phase, I talked about um, stepping back and kind of taking. Uh, a good look at the organization where it is and where it wants to go. I, I find that one of the biggest shortcomings of many boards in their quest for a new chief executive is that they start in the middle of the process and move way too quickly into the state of identifying um, what they believe to be the qualities of the ideal candidate before really defining strategic issues and priorities. And as I said, it's a very scary time for the board, which is oftentimes why they, they want to just rush right in and they pull out the job description and say, okay, here's the qualifications, let's do a search. Um, but I think really to make a good transition occur, um, you have to remember that the transition provides a unique opportunity in the life of your organization to really step back and reflect. And not just on the transition itself, but more broadly on the mission of your organization and the goals of the organization. And, and I feel like that rushing too quickly to fill the void left by your departing executive can rob your organization of the elements of this opportunity. So the first step in, in the search is not the search for the new executive, but really a, a search for where your organization wants to go. And an institutional assessment enables the board to gather the information needed to prepare a prof profile of the next chief executive and determine if board members share a common view of what the organization's priorities and direction are. I think a lot of times what I see happen when it's not a successful transition is when the board rushes in and they hire somebody who's just like the outgoing executive. And, and in, instead of really taking advantage of the opportunity of our outgoing executive did a phenomenal job and brought our organization so far, but are those really the skills and qualities that we need to move to the next phase of our life? So the, I think the assessment is really important. 
Um, next slide. So you want to evaluate um, the present condition of the organization, the challenges looming on the horizon, and the future direction that will enable the organization to survive and grow. So you're going to want to solicit input from every board member as well as your other key stakeholders. And don't forget staff members can provide valuable perspectives on the needs of the organization and the style of leadership required. Give them opportunities to make candid suggestions on the organization's um, leadership needs. You can um, solicit information from your membership, um, from the outgoing executive, from your major funders, from direct service volunteer leaders, from consultants that have worked with the agency, and anybody else that is you consider to be a respected outsider. Helping the outgoing executive director develop an organizational audit to determine key goals um, during his remaining tenure or her remaining tenure is also very important uh, to help um, support this assessment. You're going to explore challenges that might confront the new executive director as well as how to acquaint the new executive with the organization's strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities for growth. So what you're going to see here is um, it's very much like an assessment you might do if you were doing strategic planning. And if you've just done a strategic plan, you very much can use that input. Um, but if it's been a couple of years, then I would suggest that you're, you do a new assessment. Um, next slide, please. So the, uh, talk about the aspects of the assessment um, is the board really needs to take as long as it needs to do this institutional assessment before beginning the search. Um, the objective here is to kind of identify the, the institutional issues that the next chief executive is expected to take on. You're going to want to ask questions that will yield the best appraisal of the organization's present condition and its future needs. I suggest um, that you look at assessing in eight key areas. Um, so you're going to want to look at your mission and revisit the reason for the organization's existence and the vision um, of what it is that you hope to be in the future, you know, view, the view of the organization's desired future really will help the board determine the kind of chief executive it needs to guide that vision. Uh, you want to do assessment in um, financing. Um, it's a good time for the board to make sure it has a true picture of whether the organization's financial condition is strong, weak, or pretty steady. Um, you want to look at governance, the role, the structure, and performance of the board and how it views its relationship to the chief executive will influence the character of the executive transition. The, the, so the board really should take some time to define its role in relationship to the chief executive to identify areas of board operation that might need attention and to highlight how a new chief executive will be expected to work with and through the board. Management, um, two of the most precious assets to most nonprofit organizations are the employees and the volunteers who advance the organization's mission through their day-to-day -day work. The chief executive creates a climate that fosters high performance, healthy group dynamics, and accountability from staff and volunteers. So professional staff will be a key source of intelligence on the kind of management style that works best within your organization. You will want to assess communication, um, in an, an increasingly competitive environment and a lot of scrutiny from our government regulators and from our donors and from our members has really prompted nonprofit leaders to invest greater resources in actively promoting the unique value of their services and activities. An executive leadership transition affords an opportunity to review how the next chief executive can really strengthen the organization's marketing and public relations, promotion, and outreach efforts. You will look at the institutional culture, which reflects the human side of organizational life, the kind of written and unwritten rules that shape how your organization operates and the basic assumptions and shared beliefs about the place that people bring to their work. Look at which aspects of the communal culture need to be nurtured, altered, or even maybe radically changed. This will give you some major clues for determining the skills and personal style that the next chief executive has to bring. Um, and some other general questions, are there mega issues facing your agency, um, thinking about the top three leadership skills needed, um, what's important to our institutional value system. Out of that is going to emerge um, is a blueprint for the type of leadership that's needed to help 
initiate progress in the areas that are identified by the survey respondents. Um, and you can gather this information in a number of ways. You can do it um, by doing a survey, you know, where you develop a, um, a simple survey, maybe using SurveyMonkey, and you send it out to your key constituents, to your membership, to your volunteers, to your board. Um, it, it allows the most input, um, but not as personal. So you might want to think about which groups would it be best to um, do in a survey. You can also do focus groups where you bring people together and ask them questions, and, and that sometimes helps people you know, brainstorm off of uh, ideas off of each other. And then you can also do one-on-one -on -one interviews. If, if there's a real <coughs> key stakeholder um, that's been involved for a long time, it, the outgoing executive could be a one-on-one -on -one interview. Um, and so you have options for how you solicit the information. <coughs> I think that boards that neglect doing this um, end up creating requirements for the new chief executive that are really based solely on their perceptions um, of the strengths and flaws of the last person in that office. So if you will, uh, next slide, <coughs> Take once you've done the assessment and if the right questions have been uh, asked, then the emerging profile of the organization's needs and where it must go begin to create a portrait for the kind of professional leadership it needs to help it get there. Um, the board's going to be developing a packet of information that describes the organization, its mission, its goals, kind of basic services that are done by the coalition or by, one, by its member pro program um, so that they'll be marketing the organization to prospective clients. Um, but using the assessment, you, what you're going to find are the, uh, that I'm trying to think of the word I want, the, the bubble up from the assessment really is, um, what skills, what background, what expertise, what knowledge do we need from our um, or from our for our new executive? Um, so to determine which leadership competencies are most essential, you want to zero in on the strategic imperatives that emerge from the assessment. Does it reveal that your organization most needs a visionary who can frame the strategy, drive innovation, and radically grow the organization? Or do the results highlight a need for a seasoned manager who can provide stability and make fine course corrections as needed? Does the coalition need primarily a turnaround expert who can restructure and rehabilitate the organization? Or does it need a leader who can take a good organization to new heights by securing new financing or offering new alliances? Does the chief executive need to be a transformational change agent who can navigate the turbulent passages you know, required to keep the organization robust? Or does she simply need to bring a sufficient reserve of adaptive skills to promote stability? Few executives will be equally gifted in all of the leadership requirements that emerge from the assessment. So the goal is to develop a highly focused, relevant, and authentic list of qualifications connecting your organization's needs to the requirements of the chief executive without just parroting the usual, you know, leadership constructs on some list that you see, you know, for leaders for strong leaders. And I, I like the quote I have at the bottom of this slide, boards don't take the most qualified candidate. Take the candidate that fits best and has the qualifications to do the job. And candidates shouldn't take the offer just because there's not something better. A bad job fit is a bad job fit. You're going to be uh, you're going to be unhappy, and that's from uh, Douglas Klein with the National Association of Housing Cooperatives. I, I, I also want to say, well, I'll say that. I'll save that for later. So <laughs> next slide. Um, so from that work of prioritizing, um, matching the needs of the organization with the leadership competencies that are being sought in the next chief executive is – um, probably one of the most important tra transition activities in the search phase um, during this process. And it flows from your analyses and describes the skills, qualities, talents, experience, and education that a new executive will need to take the organization in the direction it needs to go. You are creating a chief executive recruitment profile. And, and this is a final document approved by the board before the job is announced that describes your organization and its needs, the, the summary principal responsibilities of the next chief executive, the required leadership competencies that you're looking for, the desired experience and qualifications, um, the compensation, and then the 
process for applying um, for the position. Now, I want you to notice that the chief executive profile um, is not just the job description. The job description outlines what the person does. The, the le leadership recruitment profile outlines the kind of person that you're looking for to do the job. So it's really important to focus that on, on, on what they bring to the organization um, rather than what they need to do once they get there. So you want to make sure that it's very clear and concise. You want to not overdefine a particular goal or expectation because that will allow for some creativity from your um, appointees. Um, think about the required qualifi qualifications. Are they consistent with the compensation that you're going to be offering? Stay away from arbitrary qualifications. Um, I think. Uh, one of the things that's hard to, to measure in this process is chemistry. In, um, it's very important, dynamic for you know, the board and executive and the staff. Um, so you, the board will need to carefully weigh the potential of a candidate and the chemistry they feel with, with him or her. Um, I think one of the things that I've done oftentimes is when we send out our leadership recruitment profile, we ask the candidates to provide in their cover letter a summary of how they meet the three or four um, primary characteristics and qualifications or experience we're looking for um, so that that helps us sort through the candidates a good bit. So we really focus in on um, this chief executive profile and what it is that we're looking for for our next person. All right, so next slide. You also have to think about um, what it is that you're going to do with the departing executive. I think <clears throat> this responsibility really lies with the board, and there are several issues that you want to consider. First and foremost, the, you know, the board's first allegiance is to the organization and not to the departing executive. And that is really hard for some boards. And it's really hard for some departing executives. Um, if the executive has been very effective, the board has to think about how long can the, you know, the executive director continue to be effective once they've given their notice. Um, and of course, if the executive is leaving under not pleasant circumstances, it's almost always best for him or her to leave immediately. Um, the board is going to want to move quickly to extract as much information as possible from the departing executive. We know this to be true. The executives are the ones who know the most about the organization than anyone else, and usually what they do is they keep it it's mostly in their head. And for those of you who participated in the previous webinar, The Art of Succession Planning, we talked about the briefing book or the bus book or the lottery book, lots of different names for it, where you, know, the, you can maintain a lot of the information that's needed. Um, and and in related to that, the executive typically has the broadest range of contacts with the organization's partners, with the membership, and with the funders, and these relationships really have to be transferred either to a board member or to a senior staff member or ideally to um, a new executive if that's, if that's possible. And, you know, memory tends to enhance the stature of those who move on. So a marginal executive can become a good one, a particularly good one can become a saint very quickly after departing. And so it's important for the board to be gracious in acknowledging the good work of the departing executive, but really focus on cultivating the strengths of your new um, executive. So next slide, Lindsay, please. So here's some possible things that the departing executive could do. Um, first, the executive has to give the board a clear picture of what has to be done during the transition. Um, which requires that they ask, is the organization ready for this change? Um, what things need to be done before we make a public announcement about the impending departure? Can the executive director, current executive director accomplish actions or does the organization need outside help? You need to be thinking about are there any internal candidates, um, thinking about what could derail the success of the new director, um, are there unex unrealistic expectations? Um, by the board, you know, is the current executive director doing the job of three people? Um, is that that's pretty unrealistic? Um, and and really shift the the departing director really needs to shift their priorities to very short-term actions that 
will um, solely be about strengthening the organization before he or she leaves. Okay, so next slide. Um, as part of the leadership recruitment profile, you're going to want to develop an organizational overview. Um, and this is done by the transition committee. That's just a, a brief overview of um, your mission. I think we talked about this, your mission, your goals, your vision for the future. Um, and it is given to uh, everybody who is interested in the organization. It includes um, you know, your history as well. I think that you have to remember um, that once you get to the finalist stage, they're um, going to require and really are entitled to much more information, um, a more comprehensive overview that talks about um, the needs and challenges of the organization. They should get copies of your annual reports and your financial statements, recent newsletters, your an said the annual report. Um, you know, whatever it is, they might bylaws might be another one that they they need to know in order to make sure that it's a good fit. <clears throat> and because you know, doing that, it gives um, candidates the full understanding before they start negotiating, and it gives you, um, um, it gives the board an additional tool for evaluating candidates. <coughs> All right. So the last thing you need to decide before you start your search is the compensation and benefits package. Uh, sorry, Ashley. Uh, Ashley. Lindsay, next slide. Um, a, a new executive is going to be looking for two things. They're, they're going to be looking for a sense of satisfaction and a job well done, and they're going to be looking for compensation. Satisfaction, unfortunately, comes with time in service, so it doesn't provide you much with a negotiating tool. So the compensation package is really going to be the fundamental tool you're going to have in attracting the right exec, executive. And the compensation includes the salary and, and the various insurances and retirement and your sick leave and personal leave policies? Are you willing to pay relocation expenses? Um, do you offer continuing education? Um, take a look at what um, other private sector, public sector, and nonprofit executives with similar levels of responsibility are making. Um, remember, you get what you pay for. And again, I, I would imagine that NNEDV would be a great resource to you all um, for looking at an equitable compensation package. You can also look to your state um, nonprofit association. Many states associations do salary surveys so that you can see what other folks are making um, based on you know a variety of different characteristics or qualifications. So um, you know make sure that what you're putting together and offering is um, fair and enticing to new candidates. And in all fact, right. uh, Colleen, I'll just interrupt you real quick. Uh, this is Lindsay from NNADV. The Resource Sharing Project has actually pulled together um, and I think does so every five years uh, a salary survey um, that's confidential for um, state coalitions. And I think it might also um, extend to local programs, but I'm not 100% sure. So um, that might be a good thing to reference. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. I, think I remember seeing that, I think, now that you mentioned that. Okay, so we're on the next slide. It says recruiting and hiring. It's time to advertise. Um, so you're using your leadership profile as your means for advertising. Um, you have to, of course, come up with a protocol for responding. So, and you know, what's going to be done to screen applicants and, and notify applicants of their first cut of their status. Um, so the first step is obvious. You're going to get the word out, and there's lots of ways to do that. You know, newspapers, um, national uh, national organizations, in-house publications, your website. Um, local nonprofit associations, national job postings, the internet. Um, I find a couple of places that have been really useful in um, advertising. Um, one is with NNEDV with the listserv. That was really helpful for you all. Absolutely wonderful because it gets it out to other ne nearby states. Um, and there is a uh, national organization called idealist.org um, that really – attracts folks um, who want to make social change. In fact, that's their buzzword. Um, we got some fabulous candidates from there, uh, and I have uh, with numerous organizations. And then the other best way is by word of mouth. Um, I strongly recommend that e every board member takes the recruitment profile and shares it with everybody they know, that the staff sends it out, that you ask um, your local service, other service providers to send it out. 
because that I, it's just amazing how many more qualified applications I get that way than listing in a, in a uh, newspaper or kind of one of the general job posting places. Um, like uh, I can't think of any. Is it Monster? Is one of them. So anyway, I really think that asking board members, asking your partners, asking your funders to spread to spread the word is one of the most um, productive ways of getting the word out. Um, I will tell you that idealist.org does charge, um, but I didn't find it to be terribly uh, expensive. Um, so you're casting the net as widely as you can. Um, you might look at you know po posting it through minority publications and organizations to make sure that you get a diverse pool of candidates. Um, rather than um, you might list the salary range. Um, uh, talk about how people need to reply in writing and provide a resume. Um, they need to be sent to a specific individual, so somebody on the committee needs to decide who that's going to be. Uh, if you've hired a professional, that's what I do is I have all the resumes come to me. Um, but somebody's got to get them and somebody's going to have to uh, review them. So you, you also want to think about do you want to do a deadline, um, application deadline. And honestly, I have to tell you, I have seen pros and cons to both, so it's really a matter of pers personal preference. Um, I've seen some folks who just leave it open and just look at the resumes as they come in, and then once they have enough good resumes, they start interviewing. Others set the deadline, they don't look at the resumes till the end of the deadline, and then they start the process. So um, really, neither I find is better than the other. Um, you need to make sure that you've got a commitment from the board that anybody from the inside will be given the same objective scrutiny as the others. Um, and if your efforts to market the position don't give you a pool of acceptable candidates, you're going to have to um, then think about you know, where do we go from here? Do we pull in a professional search team or not? So a couple things I want to say about that. Um, first, the thing about executives identifying and grooming their successor. Um, I think that what the challenge that provides is that it's not the outgoing executive director's job to hire the next person. Um, they probably have groomed the next person to do things just the way they do them. Um, and so I think while it's helpful and it's a very good idea to do the cross training and make sure that other people know how to do the executive's job, and certainly make recommendation or encourage somebody to apply for the job from inside who has all of the qualifications, who has been groomed, but you can't make any promises to them that they will be the successor because it's the board who has to decide that. Um, the second thing I want to say is um, regarding timing, it's very important that you make a commitment that if you don't get it right the first time that you're okay not just picking a candidate because you need somebody. Um, it, it's more important to find somebody to pick the right person and not just pick the top person, um, if that makes sense to you, I hope. So then we'll go on to the next slide where we're screening and I'm notifying candidates. Um, the letter of interest and the resume give the committee its first opportunity to screen and should be very carefully done so um, based on the leadership recruitment profile qualifications that were identified. Anybody that's not appropriate for the position needs to be responded to immediately with a letter saying thank you, um, but that they won't be considered. Um, I think you know. You uh, typically what we'll do is we will identify, we'll go through and screen the applicants, and the one we'll have one person do that and pick out the top five, top eight, top ten. I think that'd be enough um, candidates based on the qualifications, share those with the search committee and let the search committee decide um, which people that they want to interview. Uh, a couple of secrets about filtering, filtering out information and getting to what you really need is um, looking at education. They should list educational achievements including their degrees, their fields of study, but also keep in mind educational achievements in areas of training specifically related to the things that you're looking for. Um, clearly you're looking for some stability in their professional history, some applicable experience, supervisory responsibilities, financial authority, etc. And then also look at other achievements that are on the resume, resume that could be pertinent. 
Um, it might include awards that they've gotten, publications that they've done, service that they've had on boards. Um, and finally, um, I think oftentimes we are too quick to turn away from folks coming from the for-profit field um, because they don't understand nonprofits. But you know, as you're doing your, your review, look at um, skills and expertise that they've demonstrated in the for-profit that could transfer or translate to the nonprofit. So for example, if they, somebody is a, a huge salesman and, and was top salesman in his region for five years in a row, you know that they're going to be really good at resource development because that's, you know, it's about relationship building and, and make, making, you know, meeting people's needs for the financial. So they're, they're, you, you know, make sure that you can look, look at that right up front. So you've decided on the five people that you want to interview. Uh, next slide, please, Lindsay. And remember that the goal of this, of these preliminary interviews, is to reduce the field of candidates down to a very small group of finalists. There are two important elements of this step. It's uh, assuring that the interviews are conducted in such a way that the candidates can be measured against one another, which requires the use of a standard set of questions and a standard set of rating factors that should be developed by your transition committee or your search committee and that are based on the organizational profile. I think um, having this kind of objective rating factors really helps you, as you rate each person on each of the various qualifications and other aspects. Um, you know, it might be nonprofit management might be one of your areas that you're rating. But everybody gets rated in the same, um, in the same factors. And then making sure, of course, that legal rights of applicants are being maintained. Your committee needs to be well trained on what they can ask and what they cannot ask. Um, next slide. I get asked a lot of times, when is the best time to check references? Um, some people like to do it before preliminary interviews. Others say only before the final interview so that you're avoiding unnecessary reference checking or expenses. Um, I think whatever approach is taken, you need to be very sensitive to the issues of confidentiality and respect the applicant's wishes, especially regarding you know, present employment if they're working now. Um, checking references allows you know, input from third parties who um, in most cases have no direct interest in the outcome, um, but the process obviously has inherent weaknesses because references um, have been chosen because they probably will most likely give a positive view. Um, and others have some concerns about legal liabilities, uh, particularly you know, with previous employers, for example. Um, so what I suggest is that you work out your reference questions ahead of time, um, and for the sake of consistency and objectivity, the same set of questions should be asked of each reference, and, and those questions should be designed to provide the committee with a glimpse into the applicant's people skills, their initiative, their follow-through, uh, maybe their mission-related skills, you know, specific questions about performance or behavior are likely to get, um, are unlikely to get the kind of responses you want and could even be inappropriate or illegal. So oftentimes what I'll ask is something that's a situational question. So I'll say, tell me about an experience that you've had with the candidate that really can demonstrate their leadership skills. Or, you know, so that they have to tell me a story. I can't just say, do they have good leadership skills? Because they're going to say yes. <laughs> and then it's not a useful background check. So, you know, think up ways, come up, devise questions that will really kind of give you the information you need. Next slide is interviewing the finalists. Um, once you've narrowed down to one or two, maybe three final candidates, that's, that's pushing it, but, it, you know, you never know what you're going to have. Um, and then it's time that the search committee can present the candidates to the entire board for their review. Um, and this process typically involves a visit by the finalists to the offices and, and then interviews with the whole board and also perhaps with the staff. Um, the, the board interview can be less structured, really with the goal of establishing dialogue um, between the board and the candidate, allowing them to get to know each other, kind of get a measure of each other. Um, I actually have found uh, one thing to be particularly helpful is we ask candidates to come to the board meeting um, and give a 10 to 15 minute presentation on why they are the best candidate for the job. So you get to see them in action. You get to see their public speaking um, abilities and skills. Um, 
also then you allow the board to do some um, follow-up questions based on their presentation and, of course, based on their resume. But that way you're getting away from them being asked the same questions that they were asked in the first interview, um, and it has worked out really well. And a lot of organizations also use the interview visit as an opportunity to introduce the candidates to the organization staff, um, especially those who have a reporting relationship with the executive director. And, and we know the hiring decision rests with the board. And meetings with the staff gives the dual benefit of have, giving them a sense of being involved in the process and getting yet another set of impressions about the candidates so that, you know, you might have the staff um, have one person come in and, and share with the board what their perceptions and thoughts were about each candidate. And so the staff gives input, the board has their interview, and then they um, – discuss the, the candidates and make a final decision. And then it's time to make an offer and negotiate with the finalists. Um, so by the time you've gotten to that stage, there's probably been, uh, hopefully, discussion of the compensation and, with the candidate and what their, can, what their expectations are about compensation. So making an offer and negotiating a compensation package that fits with the board, that the board has approved and satisfies the candidate's expectation falls to the board chair. Um, the offer can be presented verbally, but should be provided in writing as well to make sure that there aren't any misunderstandings. Um, you want to make sure you stay away from language guaranteeing the position. Um, it should include a deadline for their response, and, and you may want to have it reviewed by a, a human resource specialist. If um, serious negotiations are required, the board should talk openly with the candidate to determine what interests are impacting um, their negotiating position. Make, you know, if you can find out what the underlying interests are rather than just reacting to the negotiation, you'll find that the board and the candidate you know, can probably come to a much better understanding. And if it turns out that a deal can't be struck with a first choice candidate, then you're going to have to assess whether the second choice or third choice um, will be considered. And, and again, this is, well, this is a time when um, you have to take a look at uh, is this person the right person? Are we are we um, choosing the second candidate just because we're desperate to have somebody come in, or are they really good the, a good fit for what we want? Um, and so that's really important. And I've seen it happen where the the second candidate was offered the job and turned out to, to really have far exceeded what we had hoped for with the first candidate. So it, it is very possible, um, but if not you have to come to a place where it's okay to start the search over again because you, it's so important to um, have the right person. And, and so once you've got the offer in writing and they've agreed, you know, you want to document the agreement that's signed by the new executive and placed in their personnel file that kind of outlines, you know, dear candidate, we're excited to have you start um, as the executive director on such and such date for, you know, listing out the compensation and the benefits if there's any special considerations like, training issues or re relocation expenses, um, any agreed upon performance expectations. Um, you want to obviously give them the employee handbook and other necessary policies and procedures. Um, next phase. So hiring the next executive director is the end of phase two and allows you to begin phase three, which is the beginning which might seem obvious. You set a date for the new executive director to start. Um, and, and when, you know, when they have moved their things into the office and they sit in on the first staff meeting, you've made the change. But that's not the beginning. It's the start. And as I said, starts are practical. Beginnings are internal. Um, beginnings involve new understandings, new values, new attitudes. You know, when you move into that new house, that's not the beginning. It's not until all the boxes are unpacked and the mail's being delivered and, and they've changed their voicemail and people are regularly calling and new routines are established that it's that then you say, this is our new leader. So beginnings have to be nurtured. And again, the timing cannot be measured in dates. They are, uh, it happens when psychological acceptance has taken place. It can only occur after you've gone through the ending in neutral zones, and it, it happens when you have new understandings and new values, um, when you've got um, – remember that, that employees want this to happen, but there's, there's still going to be some fear at this time. Um, you might also find that the ending is kind of ratified and some of those old anxieties might reemerge, but there also will be excitement and renewed energy. So. Um, 
some strategies for an effective beginning is creating a formal agreement between the new executive and board that clearly spells out the priorities, um, expectations, the roles. You want to communicate uh, with each em employee about their part in, the, in the be this new beginning, reaffirm the overall mission um, and, your, and the staff's contribution to the mission. You want to be able to communicate again, keep the communication going. You want to be thinking about peer networking to help the new executive. Um, you want to be introducing capacity building activities. Eventually you're going to want to set long-term goals. And please don't forget to validate and re reward employees um, and how they manage the transition. Um, next slide. I'm going to suggest that you have a post-appointment transition plan because way too often um, I find that board de detach from the, organ you know, from the process too quickly. Um, it, uh, so it's, this is the time where you want to really blend a skillful blend of uh, board oversight and support without m micromanagement. It's also going to re require the new chief executive's initiative in inviting and welcoming assistance, <coughs> excuse me, and hopefully the staff's proactive role in helping the new executive learn about the organization. Um, next slide. So properly integrating the new executive into the organization is, is as important as making the right hire. Most people agree that one of the constants of life is change, and one of the constants of change is that people don't like it. So while the style, personality, and behavior of the new executive will ultimately determine his or her relationship with the staff, the board is in a position to positively influence how that relationship begins. So some things to consider. Um, again, you know, while the departing executive really deserves thanks and a gracious thank send off, the responsibility of the board is to the organization's future, specifically to the new executive director. So don't overdo all the accolades given to the departing exec. Um, the, a, a welcome committee and the board chair should meet with the staff before the arrival of the new executive and discuss with them the hiring process and share with the staff their support and their enthusiasm for the new exec. Um, the board needs to be aware of the human issues that the staff is dealing with as it goes through this change and be sensitive to individuals or groups that are um, prepared to manifest their discomfort by, let's say, disruptive behavior. Um, you know, be pre-warned and, and prepared. You need to have somebody, um, a, a representative of the board, preferably the chair, be on hand um, to welcome the executive at their, on their first day when they get to the office to help orient them um, to the office and make introductions to the staff. If you had an interim director, um, it might be helpful to arrange for that person to remain on for a couple of weeks to help the new exec settle in and become acquainted with the procedures and issues. Um, beyond welcoming the new exec to the office, the board has to make sure that he or she is properly introduced to the organization's um, service providers, so the attorneys, the accountants, the bankers, the consultants, and help uh, assist in the transfer of their allegiance from the departing to the, to, or the interim exec to the new one. And, and really, you know, if you have the board involved in these introductions, it helps really legitimize the authority of the new executive director. Um, you're also going to need to make introductions with the leaders of your partners, your sponsoring organizations, your principal funders, um, introducing to the state coalition, to other coalition directors, to your membership. Um, you, you know, the process of the transition really is only half done. Um, when they, the new exec signs on. So set up a special committee to handle the transition to help welcome, you know, to prepare the staff for the arrival, to um, put out a public um, a press release about welcoming the new executive to the community, um, introducing the new executive to stakeholders, you know, maybe doing a welcome uh, reception. Um, and, and again, if you have the interim, helping them under, introduce. Um, so then I, next slide, suggest also that you develop written goals and expectations for the new executive director. Um, one option is, um, to, is to develop a 90-day work plan for the individual in which the board and the executive agree on the priorities for the first three months. And it's going to include things like making those introductions I just talked about. It's going to mean having the new executive assess the current operations, get real comfortable with the work, with the communication styles, with the staff, 
Um, you might, if you have short and long-term plans in place, the new exec might give those a critical review um, and be open, and then have the board be open to new insights um, on how um, those plans can be improved. Um, I think the board members need to monitor the climate during the chief executive's first few months, uh, keeping in perspective that there's going to be some speed bumps along the way. Um, you know, the grieving that follows the departure of the former chief executive. Um, there might be personnel changes the new executive wants to make. There may be some reorganization of systems. Um, and again, just about any other change is likely to be greeted with some scrutiny and some resistance. So recognizing um, that those are going to happen in the, most likely in the first 90 days as well. So you want the board and exec to work together as early as possible and as often as needed to agree on what the goals for the organization are going to be, defining the roles, who's going to do what, what tasks are going to need to be done immediately. Um, during these early months, the chief executive should proactively look for the board's advice and feedback. Um, and, and then you want to set, it, set up some uh, you want to do a check-in at the end of the 90 days on how did that go. Um, that gives the board an opportunity to kind of revisit the relationship that was established at the time of hiring. And then you'll do a second more formal evaluation by the chair and the executive committee at six months um, to let the executive know about any early concerns they have. And then you go to your annual 12-month evaluation um, um, that gets, you know, at, measures against previously agreed upon goals, the objectives and expectations of the job, um, and that type of thing. And then um, I would say, next slide, you, you want to make sure that you retain the next executive, right? Um, you you got to figure out how to keep the new person, keep the train on the tracks. Um, and, an important board assignment is to create an environment that um, assures that your executive has every opportunity to succeed. Um, I've talked about in other webinars a climate for success that um, encourages um, the executive's growth, you know, encouraging them to join professional organizations, attend training events, visit with executives of other successful nonprofits. The National Coalition is doing a great mentor program for new execs now that, you know, so they can get to know um, other people um, throughout the country that are doing that work. Um, you want to stay on top of the marketplace in terms of compensation to make sure this is the board um, that, that the compensation is in line with the, the new person's performance. You got to keep open, uh, ongoing, active communication, and they need to continue to, to perform. Um, I see a lot of new execs get disillusioned with the organization when it becomes apparent that the board's not willing or able to do the things that the board is supposed to be doing. So the board needs to regularly evaluate itself and make sure that they're doing the right job. Last slide, um, a couple of tips for incoming directors. Um, th they're going to want to get connected to the organization as quickly as possible. So I would focus on three levels. Um, first, learning the organization, paying attention to the realities, and being prepared for surprises. Um, I would say um, within the first two weeks, if not before starting the job, the new director should review the bylaws, the current financial statements, um, probably up to a year of board meeting minutes to kind of get a sense of where the board's been focusing. Uh, you want to know the board of directors roster. If you have advisory committee rosters, you want, they want to be able to look at all contracts, including um, grants. They should um, become familiar with a summary of funding commitments and as well as recent rejections, any agreements that they have like property, rental, uh, equipment leases. Um, they need to get familiar with the existing personnel policies and procedures, the audits, and any findings, the staff roster, and um, physical equipment inventories. So that's learning the organization. And then setting direction and priorities, the new executive director should develop work plans <coughs> excuse me, in writing <coughs> for the board to use in evaluating his or her performance. Um, and, and I think the new executive should insist on a three-month informal check-in that is, I just told the board to do um, so that there's constant feedback. Um, and you want to plan the first meeting. Um, you want the um, chief executive to conduct information interviews. and Because <coughs> one of the most valuable things a new executive can do is to listen to a variety of constituencies, um, particularly the board and staff, to get you know, a wide range of perspectives on the institutional strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges. They certainly should take a look at the findings of the assessment 
that you did. And then remember building consensus with the board and staff is going to take time and going to be one of the biggest challenges for the new director. Fully understanding the organization and its formal and informal relationships is an incremental process that can honestly take more than a year. Um, so meetings with staff and board should always be a priority um, and make sure that the board has outlined ex expectations as quickly as possible. And finally, I want to say new directors have to feel comfortable admitting what they do not know and be able to ask for support with their orientation and their professional development needs. Um, and again, I find it to be incredibly helpful to have a mentor outside of the organization um, who can really help your new director observe and process events within the organization. So I'm just so pleased that and then EDB is doing that for new coalition directors. The last slide is a list of some um, reference books that I um, can recommend. Um, as I said at the beginning, the Nancy Axelrod book is um, really great. Um, uh, there's a couple other things in here that um, can be helpful as well. And so, um, Lindsay, we can open it up for uh, questions and comments and chats. Uh, and reminder, I can't see the chat box, so I'm not sure. Sure. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the